For all its richly textured narratives and innovative tale-telling, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales begins with a simple action, an individual pilgrim joining a larger group of pilgrims. Though often overshadowed by Chaucer's series of portraits and the contest of tales, this innocuous action establishes an underlying but significant concern about the relationship between the individual and corporate society. Chaucer examines this idea at length in his work. While all the pilgrims toward Canterbury will read, Chaucer the pilgrim has begun the first step of this journey by himself. We find him taking his nightly rest in a tavern at Southwark, which lies just across the Thames from London proper, where he encounters the Canterbury-bound pilgrims. When the moment is right, Chaucer takes the initiative to join their company with, of course, their unanimous approval. As he states, And shortly when the son was to rest, so had he spoken with him every one, that he was of her fellowship anon. This self-invitation reveals a need, or at least a strong desire within Chaucer, to find and in, uh, integrate himself into the fabric of this mobile society, or, as I will suggest, a city on the move. It is this action, I propose, that drives the narrative force of Chaucer's pilgrims, their interpersonal interactions, and their telltelling. The tension between individual expression and societal acceptance not only serves the narrative impetus, but also forms one of the fundamental concerns of Chaucer's social commentary. While Chaucer's pilgrims might, at first glance, seem like a limited cross-section of late 14th century English society, they, never they nevertheless illustrate elements of a London's larger social sphere. Peter Brown, however, cautions us that notwithstanding the portraits of the knight, the plowman, and the parson, Chaucer, quote, uses decidedly selective principles, which when compared to the categories delineated in the poll tax of 1379, look decidedly unrepresentative with regards to the demographic layout of London. Brown notes that Chaucer's series of portraits in the prologue describes only two women and altogether neglects the noble class. Furthermore, while theories and critical discussions about Chaucer's employment of the three estates continue to abound, Brown observes, quite rightly, that these portraits do not, quote, sit easily, end quote, within clearly demarcated boundaries of those who fight, those who pray, and those who work. Indeed, Chaucer seems to have a keen interest in the social overlapping of the bourgeoisie, whose societal roles resist static categories and, in fact, encourage social mobility. Thus, Brown contends, quote, it might also be reasonable to conclude that what guided Chaucer was the teeming of life around him, which, from his limited, liminal position, he was ideally placed to observe either at court or at the wool quay or in the streets of London. All of these societies. Chaucer's use of a state satire is therefore not predicated on a view of society as tripartite. Rather, it is more in line with the flexible or hybrid estates that characterized some, but not all, of London's social strata. The Fellowship of Pilgrims is composed of the types of people ambling through the avenues of London whom Chaucer would have encountered on a daily basis. Although it is not a proportionally exact representation of 14th century London society, Chaucer's Fellowship of Pilgrims functions as a characteristic assortment of several corners of that society. Chaucer, in essence, creates a literary mural that is focused not on vertical hierarchy, but on horizontal community. It arranges, in other words, not from high to low, but from elegant to the austere, from the seedy to the sincere. Even as selective and imprecise a patchwork as the pilgrims are, they derive from part of London's metropolitan society, and thereby they come to represent the philosophic ideal of the city, an ideal first defined in Aristotle's politics. Clarifying this definition of the city, Leo Strauss states that, quote, it is a society which embraces various kinds of smaller and subordinate societies that becomes a city, and which is, quote, the most comprehensive and the highest society, since it aims at the highest and most comprehensive good at which any society can aim, end quote, and that is happiness. As a corporate society, Chaucer's pilgrims then operate as both a synecdoche of the city, a part of the whole to which Chaucer turns his attention, as well as a city unto themselves, a manifestation of the ideal of the city rather than a proportionally accurate cross-section. Chaucer is not so much concerned with the actual cities to which his pilgrims travel from and to, but with Aristotle's philosophic ideal. The pilgrims spend the majority of their time between London and Canterbury, yet they symbolize and exemplify the fundamental purpose of the city. Thus, their troop demonstrates the ideal of the city by the very society which they form. 
Wherever they may be on the road between London and Canterbury, they are nonetheless a city, according to Chaucer. When they take their leave of London, they neither sever their symbolic link to London, uh, unlike, the, uh, Boca uh, unlike Boccaccio's young Florentines do in the Decameron, nor do they cease to function as a city in and of themselves. Since their society is the basis for the city, Chaucer's pilgrims can depart from and arrive at a city's physical location, but they cannot move beyond the ideal of the city, which always travels with them. Chaucer seems to adhere to the classic, that is, Aristotelian, concept of the city by emphasizing the societal character of his fellowship of pilgrims. But he anticipates a modern concept of the city by calling attention to the city's essential, albeit subjective, goal of happiness, quote, the common good at which any political society aims, end quote. Chaucer's pilgrims have an overall focus on attaining and maintaining happiness. First, Chaucer stresses the felicitous state of their, of their society in the Cheapside Tavern. Concerning the disposition of the entire fellowship of pilgrims, including Chaucer, the corpulent and bright-eyed tavern host Harry Bailey jocularly observes, New lording is truly, you been to me great welcome heartily, for be me truth, if that ye shall not thee, ye saw not this year so merry a company at once in this herbore as is new. End quote. Whether Harry Bailey is playing up his role as the host with some mellifluous words and exaggerated phrases, Chaucer notes that he was, quote, bold of a specia and wheeze and well he taught it, end quote, or he is speaking from a spirit of genuine interest. His description of the pilgrims concentrates on their happiness. Indeed, Harry Bailey, prior to joining their company as the governor and judge and reporter of their contest of telltelling, comments that he would gladly like to add to their happiness. Quote, Fain will de edon you murtha, wisty ho, and over murtha im right now be thought, to doon is and it shall cost nocht. He informs the pilgrims that he has devised a way to further amuse or entertain them, and that there is no charge for this additional pleasure. Of course, things freely purchased are more freely enjoyed. <laughs> With his interest on murtha and es, I dare say obsession, as he employs these words time and again <laughs> throughout his dialogues, Harry voices the principal purpose of the city, according to a more modern understanding, that is. Strauss explains that Aristotle thought that happiness derived from moral virtue and a liberal education. But in modern times, happiness was treated as a matter of personal taste. Quote, it, came, it became the purpose of political society to guarantee those conditions of happiness which came to be understood as the natural rights of each, and to refrain from imposing on its members happiness of any sort, for no notion of happiness can be intrinsically superior to any other notion." End quote. So long as the city fosters the pursuit of happiness, it accomplishes its principal objective and confirms its raison d'etre. Although he only touches on the modern sense of the city by emphasizing happiness over moral virtue, Chaucer treats happiness as a collective good, and for the purposes of their journey, the chief concern of their actions, namely their telltelling. In this way, the Canterbury Pilgrims further exhibit their, relationship, their relation to and representation of the city. Chaucer's Pilgrims, however, however, are not a uniform society, nor are they flat caricatures of their respective estates. On the contrary, their society is composed of distinct individuals. Indeed, Chaucer has a tendency in his works of sculpting a unique person out of a traditional character type. This tendency applies most assuredly to his pilgrims, whom he fashions as figures in high relief to their estate. Though connected to a particular estate type, each pilgrim displays distinctive speech, singular mindsets, and personalized tastes in their array, their manner of condition, and their likes and dislikes. Chaucer the Pilgrim goes so far as to warn his readers about the individualized nature of the tales he recounts, including their content and their language, all of which convey distinct individuals and intimate the rough contours of subjectivity. While the main purpose of his forewarning lies in expiating himself for his lack of censorship in faithfully reproducing each tale and therefore preventing any undue defamation of him and his work, in other words, asking for pardon rather than for permission, a secondary purpose is implied. Chaucer the Pilgrim distinguishes between his words and the words of the Pilgrim telltellers. He indicates that not only is the content of each tale important to write down, but the personal manner in which the tale is told is also worth recording. Quote, For this 
ye knowen all so well as ye, whoso shall tell a tell after a man, he mote rehearse as ne as ever he can, ever it shall word, if it be if it be in his charge, all spake he never so rudelich or larger, or else he mote tell in his tell untrue, or feign thing, or fiend a wordless newer. End quote. Chaucer insists that anyone repeating a tale ought, in, ought to endeavor excuse me, ought to endeavor to uphold the way that it was first delivered, as if there is a personal stamp on each tale with which one should not tamper or distort, regardless of how coarse or offensive that tale may be. To remove this stamp by changing or making up new words would somehow diminish both its quality and the individuality of its original narrator. Chaucer continues, He may not spare, although he were his brother, he mote as well say a word as another, end quote. Even if the original narrator were his brother, whom one was trying to keep from ridicule, Chaucer argues that modifying the unique choices that went into the tailing of the tale, if only by a word, would change its nature from idiosyncratic to prosaic. Chaucer concludes the speech by ribbing his audience that no one would alter the parables of Christ and philosophy of Plato, though the former spoke plainly and the latter associated the quality of words with a degree of character. Chaucer is so adamant to preserve, so adamant to preserve the individuality of each pilgrim that he does not even change their original order as so as to follow the established hierarchy of society. But given the complexity of most of the pilgrims' fluid and blurred estates, such a task would be quite frustrating, if not altogether impossible. Chaucer's fidelity to the personalized nature of each tale in conjunction with Harry Bailey's proposed competition of tale-telling demonstrates that the city's main purpose of providing a means of individual happiness reinforces society's concern for the individual as well as the corporateness of that society. Strauss expounds on this interrelationship with remarkable lucidity and bears quoting at length. The purpose of the individual and the purpose of political society are essentially different. Each individual strives for happiness as he understands happiness. This striving, which is partly competitive and partly cooperative with the strivings of everyone else, produces or constitutes a kind of web. That web is society as distinguished from the state which merely secures the conditions for the striving individual. It follows that in one respect the state is superior to society, for the state is based on what all must equally desire because they all equally need it, on the conditions of happiness. And that in another respect, society is superior to the state, for society is the outcome of each individual's concern with his end, whereas the state is concerned only with certain means. When applied to Chaucer's pilgrims, Strauss's elucidation reveals that their society actively pursues happiness on an individual level, societal level, and a state level. On the individual level, each pilgrim strives to narrate tales that are pleasing to themselves, or as Harry describes, quote, of best sentence and most solace, end quote. Whether what is pleasing means entertaining, ridiculing, aggrandizing, or even instructing. Moreover, they compete against one another for, quote, a supper at a certain priest. On a societal level, the pilgrims form an audience to which these tales can be told and by whom they can be judged, thereby enabling the individual narrator a higher degree of satisfaction. Their contest of tales is only one way in which their individual strivings constitute the web of society to which Strauss is referring. The distinctive voices of their resuscitations, in other words, figuratively blend together and help harmonize their society though this harmony is not without its, di its discord at times. Their society serves to help each pilgrim find their own form of happiness. Traveling in the safety of numbers, joining together for companionship, and sharing in the same desire to seek some sort of healing or absolution at the shrine of Thomas a Becket within Canterbury Cathedral are the concerns of the state level of their mobile city. These are the conditions that all of the pilgrims need equally, their felt needs, as it were. Accordingly, the pilgrim's representation and manifestation of the philosophic ideal of the city simultaneously encompasses these levels of the individual society and the state. Chaucer, the author, constructs his work around these concepts, making use of their cooperative and competitive forces. The classic philosophical concept of the city, with its interrelationship between the individual and society, becomes the basis for Chaucer's narrative framework. The pilgrim's fellowship, the premise of their tale-telling, 
His persona as a fellow pilgrim and the various associations between the different tales all stem from the dual purpose of the city to facilitate methods of pursuing happiness for each individual and to secure concord within the society as a whole. As an early modern scholar, I cannot help but make connections between medieval authors and their Renaissance counterparts. And thus, skipping ahead two centuries, quite shamelessly, I would like to briefly <laughs> examine how Chaucer's handling of the concept of the city, that is, its tension between the individual and society, influenced another writer whose view of the city delved much deeper than geographic locations and metropolitan institutions. Of course, I'm referring to William Shakespeare. Apologies. <laughs> A hallmark of Shakespeare's philosophical investigation into the nature and the purpose of the city can be found in Richard III, the culmination of his War of the Roses tetralogy. His play centers on the rise and fall of Richard, Duke of Gloucester. As Shakespeare's ultimate anti-hero, Richard's power lies not in his malevolent ambition, though he certainly has that, but lies more in, this, in his ability to conceal his individual ambition in the guise of societal necessity. In Act 3, Scene 7, Richard stages a kind of theatrical production that is intended to demonstrate his supposed innocence in the bloody affairs of the War of the Roses and even his own brother's imprisonment in the Tower of London, as well as convince the citizens of London that the crown is the furthest thing from his mind. Of course, the opposite is true. Richard listens to the appeals of Lord Buckingham and the Lord Mayor of London who acclaim with the support of the people that Richard's rightful place is on the throne. Ever the consummate actor, Richard pretends that such positions are beyond him and of no interest. But upon further appeals, Richard assents, saying, quote, Would you enforce me to a world of care? Well, call them again. I am not made of stone, but penetrable to your kind entreaties, albeit against my conscience and my soul. Cousin of Buckingham, and you sage grave men, since you will buckle fortune on my back, to bear her burthen, whether I will or no, I must have patience to endure the load. But if black scandal or foul-faced reproach attend the sequel of your imposition, your mere enforcement shall acquittance me from all the impure blots and stains thereof. For God, he knows, you may partly see how far I am from the desire thereof. Richard treats his accession to the throne as a last resort, brought on by the demands of the people. In other words... He acts as if he takes the scepter and crown only out of the best interest, best interest of society. Indeed, the city seemingly pleads with Richard to assume the royal mantle and then loudly proclaims his acceptance in the streets. Yet, we as the audience know that Richard's rise to power is a very individual objective, one in which he has no qualms about killing others to achieve, even his own family members. The street side production is merely a ruse meant to garner popular support for Richard's coup d'etat. In this scene, Shakespeare illustrates that the interrelationship between the city and the individual can be twisted and manipulated toward malicious ends, that the society of the city does not always seek after the highest good, and that a single person can deceive and exploit the whole of society. Whereas Chaucer explores how the city and the, and the individual collaborate for the good of both, Shakespeare displays how this collaboration can go terribly wrong. Nevertheless, both authors understand the fundamental and profound relationship that is built upon and between the society and the individual, and they make considerable use of this relationship as the foundation for their main actions of their respective narratives. Chaucer and Shakespeare establish the fact that any societal commentary or subtext must address this relationship. However simple it is to see the relationship between the individual and the city, it is, as these authors show, all the more complex to describe how that relationship is formed and maintained and how it affects human actions and behavior. Thank you.